Okay, so what I want to do today is mainly show you how I do these stems. Um, and we'll, we'll start out with something about like this. Uh, some of the pieces that I've done, and I've got some photos I'll show later, uh, the stems get quite long and I end up actually suspending the piece rather than doing it this way because after a certain length, of course, they're not going to really support anything, even their own weight. So I'm going to set this up in the front like this, though I can refer to it now and then. The other thing that I did want to mention, uh, this is the blatant commercialism aspect of this demo. Everything over there is for sale. It would it would break my heart to leave anything here, but I would I would make that sacrifice if anybody is interested. So, <laughs> uh, if you're interested, the the little pin, pins and stuff have prices on the back. The other stuff, just you know, see me and I'll 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 take a look and see. Well, how much can he afford? You know, we'll go like we'll do it like that. <coughs> so I'm just going to set this right here for right now. So hopefully, we won't bump into it. Uh, and one of the things I want to point out, everybody thinks, well, these are really fragile, and they are, but, you know, they're not so fragile that, that there, there's not any gift to them. And uh, generally I do these in maple uh, because it's a nice, strong wood, it's very close grain, and it's pretty easy to get good pieces that are really straight grain all the way around. Um, so it works really well for this kind of a, of a treatment. Uh, and the analogy I use is like it's similar to a toothpick in a way. Uh, if you have a toothpick and you're you know trying to clean between your teeth and everything, the toothpick doesn't break. The, the tip may snap a little bit, but the toothpick itself doesn't break. And it's it's smaller than this is. And uh, it's be you know because the wood is very resilient. Uh, it has give. It's not real brittle. Um, and um, so it's stronger than you than you might think, and there is some flexibility to it. So that that helps a lot. I would never, nobody would ever do it, but if you try to turn one of these out of, like, say, ebony, something like that, that's really hard and and, and very brittle, it would probably snap because there's just no give to it. But something like this is fine. I've done these in uh, cherry, poplar, uh, walnut, um, any wood that's that's got a nice close grain. And the other thing is you want to make sure that the grain is straight on all, on all the sides. <coughs> I I should put that right there. I think it'll be okay. Uh, the other thing I would ask is if, if you, you know, you're welcome to go over and, and examine any of those pieces, but please be careful with the finials and things. They get dropped a lot and I drop them, but uh, with concrete it's, it's not too friendly to them, so kind of just uh, exercise caution if you go over there and you know don't whack the side of the table or anything. Okay, so I'm going to start actually working here now. One of the things that I want to mention first is that uh, when I'm home working, I always wear a full face shield. Uh, I think it's very important to do that. <coughs> um, how many of you have not ever had a piece of wood fly off the lake? Okay. <laughs> Need I say more? Um, so it's it's very important that you wear safety protection. Face shield is a whole lot cheaper than a trip to the emergency room or worse. And uh, you want to get one that's sized to the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, you can get a you know a very inexpensive one for maybe fifteen or twenty dollars. But think about what you're doing and how much that's going to protect you. If you're doing all little pieces, you know, uh, pins, bottle stoppers, that kind of stuff. That may be fine, but if you've got a big chunk of wood on there, you want something that's going to really, really protect you. And the one I use is made by Uvex. I believe Woodcraft carries that, right? Um, and uh, it's about forty-five dollars, somewhere in that name in that range. You can get overlays for it, so if you get it scratched up, you can replace it. It's got a nice plastic frame around it, and uh, I really like it. It works works really well, it doesn't weigh much, but that, it is something that's very important that you should do. And I've just gotten in the habit of whenever I get close to the lathe, my hand just reaches for the shield the way uh, you reach for a seat belt when you get in the car. <coughs> so I don't want to harp on it, but you just want to make sure that you are well protected. Uh, I had thought about doing demos coming out in like in a, in a hockey goalie suit, you know, and uh, 
Well, that's a little too much to do. Uh, the other thing that I want to touch on briefly is sharpening. If your tools aren't sharpened properly, you're not going to have any fun, and it can also be dangerous. Now, we don't have any way to sharpen stuff here, but I really shouldn't need to anyway. But if you do not, if you don't have a, a good sharpening system, that's one of the first things you should invest in. Um, the, the kind of default system anymore is the uh, um, the one-way um, oh, Wolverine, yeah, Wolverine system, which uses a grinder and it's got these fixtures where you can put the tools up against it, and you don't have to do it by hand. It, it takes a lot of the anxiety out of sharpening. Now there are those that say you should you you've got to learn how to sharpen just freehand. Now I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, if you've got a way to do it that that will help you, by all means do it. Especially if you have just started turning. But you definitely want to make sure that your tools are sharp. If you're in doubt about it, take them down to Woodcraft. They'll help you out there, and they'll even they'll demonstrate the the um, the, the systems that they have. Uh, talk to the other turners about it, but uh, you definitely want to make sure that you always have your tools good and sharp. Uh, since I can't really wear a face shield because of the mic and everything, I am going to use these lovely goggles here. Uh, so I will have those on pretty much the duration. Also, anything that I say here is my opinion about things, and you may disagree. You'd be wrong, but you can disagree. <laughs> <coughs> so I want to start out with a, a blank. This is about an eight inch or so blank, about two by two of uh, maple that we got from Woodcraft. Uh, this one has a little bit of uh, discoloration along here. Um, I would prefer a blank that was completely clear all the way around because the, the, the base of this will probably intrude on on this part a little bit, but for, for this purpose, I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, it's pretty easy to find maple like this if, you know, uh, either at a Woodcraft or a similar store, or you just go to a hardwood lumber dealer. I don't know if you have one in Grand Rapids, um, but you can, get, you can get pieces there as well. So I'm just going to put this between centers to start because I want to put a, I want to get this turned down to round, and then I want to put a, a tenon on the end of it. Um, this is a brand new lathe, right? Never been used? All right, so um, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Brand new lathe, you know, you want to break it in. It's like a car. You, you worry about that first scratch until you get a scratch on it. So I'm just going to try to get a big scratch on here just so the thing is going to look broken in like it's been used for a while. So we'll just uh, see if this works. This isn't going to, this isn't going to work too well, I don't think. So really all I'm doing um, is um, taking the paint off the edge of the tool rest. And I had this thing worked out where it was going to look like I was actually scratching the lathe itself, but that didn't work. So <laughs> never, never try out a new joke on, you know, TV. <laughs> Practice at home. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the whole point here is that when you get a, a tool rest, there's going to be, you know, either paint on it or something, or whether it's been anodized or something, and you really don't want that because uh, you want the tool to slide across it real smoothly. And so it's a good idea to take a file to it, and eventually you're going to get some little dings in it. Uh, this, this happens in the course of turning, so you want to file that down, otherwise the tool is going to grab against it and it's going to mess up that nice smooth cut you've got. So anywhere we're ready to start and anytime uh, you start a lathe you don't want to stand right in front of it and you want to start out slow. If you have, if you have not bought a lathe yet, uh, my advice is to get one with a variable speed. You can save a, a little bit of money by getting one with belts you change, but you, don't, you can't control the speed very well. And it's a pain to change those belts back and forth all the time. So uh, you'd be much better off investing a little extra money and get a variable speed lathe. Of course, the bigger ones all come that way anyway. 
but if you're looking like at a mini lathe or something, I definitely would consider getting one that's got a, a controllable variable speed. It's much safer and you can uh, control the speed a lot better than having to stop and change belts back and forth. <coughs> so I'm going to start this uh, not real fast. I'm up around 1700 or so. And I, I don't have, I don't use a, a, a roughing gouge because the one I have is, it was like a really cheap one. It uh, doesn't work very well. And I end up using a bowl gouge for a lot of the roughing. And as I get more into this, you'll, you'll find that I end up using the easy wood tools a lot, the carbide tip tools. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. But just for right now, all I want to do is get this down to round. Again, I'm not, I'm not doing this very fast. There's a little label on here. That's what that is right in the middle. So that'll come away in a minute. All I want to do is get this down to a uh, kind of a cylinder. And I don't care how rough it is. And I'm putting my finger in back of the tool rest so that uh, I get a nice straight line. Now one of the things I, I like to recommend is when you're first starting to turn down a, a, a blank like this, uh, particularly a spindle blank like this, uh, I think it's a good idea to try to teach yourself to make that cylinder as straight as you can, even though you're going to have a lot of curves and stuff in it later. Uh, it just helps develop a little bit of muscle memory for it and uh, a little bit of tool memory and when you want to do something with it, you got a really straight line like say you want to make a rolling pin or something that's got a straight edge on it uh, by practicing at that you will have kind of developed a technique for it and just make it easier one other thing i forgot to mention with safety is don't wear a watch when you're turning i see a lot of people do that i don't think it's a good idea in my goggles. I took them off, didn't I? No wonder I'm getting all that stuff in my face. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Lovely. All right, so I think I'm all set now. So I'm just bringing this down to a, a very uh, basic cylinder. It's, I don't, the, the chuck that I'm going to use is not real big. So I want to make sure I've got enough room for a tenon on here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this down. For some reason, uh, this is a Vic Mark, I think. A Nova, yeah. Maybe it's because they're they're from New Zealand, but they they go the threads go backwards, opposite of the way you would think. <coughs> Ron had mentioned that I was in New Zealand. A couple weeks ago, uh, if you ever have a chance to visit that place, man, go. It is just a fabulous, wonderful community of wood turners there. Uh, one of the main reasons that I wanted to go was to watch water go the opposite direction down the drain. Because you're in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and the sun sets in the northwest instead of the southwest, which is kind of weird to get used to. But it's a beautiful country. Uh, like I say, the wood turning community there is you know, it's a huge presence in New Zealand, and it's not a big country. There's only like four and a half million people, and I think a million of them are wood turners because they're they're just everywhere. You can't you can't you know throw a gouge without hitting one of them. So this closes down to about an inch, and so I don't have a whole lot of room there. So I'm going to turn a tenon on this end, and I'm going to switch to the. Uh, over to the easy wood tools. Now, uh, I was, I'm going to talk about these a little bit. Uh, how many of you are not familiar with these? Okay, so virtually everybody in the room knows about them. How many of how many of you actually have some of one of these or more? Okay, so quite a few of you. They've been around for about three or four years, and when I was first starting to turn, uh, like everybody else, I was struggling with 
with the tools, figuring out the bevels, which, which gouges I needed, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was making things, but I wasn't really learning as fast as I wanted, and I was just having a really hard time with it. And um, so then I heard about these, and I got a couple, and all of a sudden I found I could do, make stuff really quickly. Uh, so I'm a big fan of them, and um, uh, I, they're, they're all American-made, which is really rare these days. Uh, it's a stainless steel shaft, solid, really uh, high-tech carbide cutter on it. Uh, the, the craftsmanship of the tool itself is just excellent. <coughs> it's coming out with new products all the time, and so I'm a big fan. So I use them all the time. And for certain operations, I find them, at least for me, to be better than almost anything else. But that's just me. So that's a case where your opinion is just as valid as mine. And I know a lot of the uh, turners have been around a while uh, are not big fans of Easy Wood because they're, you know, if you're if you're accustomed to working with traditional like sorbic kinds of tools, that's great, and uh, you don't need them. But those are that are just starting out and maybe struggling a little bit, doesn't hurt to get a couple of these, at least to get you started to to make something, and then you'll maybe you'll find you want to go back to the others, but. I probably rely on these for about 80, 85 percent of the turning that I do. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go back to this. I want to make a little tenon on the end. And when you make a tenon, um, I'll raise this up a little bit. Now the way these tools work, you just basically you set them on the tool wrist. You have them lined up with the center of the line of the lathe parallel to the floor and you just push. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry for the cough. That's the entire learning curve that's involved with these. <coughs> wow. It does get dry. <coughs> so when you make a tenon on the end of a piece like this, you want to make it so that when it's in the jaw set that the jaws are closed um, that the jaws are closed about where they are here uh, you don't want to have the jaws really spread out because then you're only relying on the points on the end to support it and you want to have as much of the face of the jaw supporting the wood as you can so you want to make this tenon small enough that the jaws will almost close completely around it and people that spend a lot of time at the lathe will be able to do that by eye. Uh, I don't, um, most of my work I probably is probably 20% on the lathe, 80% doing other stuff, sometimes even greater percentage. <coughs> so um, I have to measure each time. Of course the main thing is you don't want to make this tenon smaller than the opening. And that's a little, little bit to go. The other thing is that you want to have the, the face here to be flat up against the face of the jaws. You don't want this to bottom out on the end because the face where the, that, uh, where, the, where the shoulder meets the face of the jaws is a very important structural element in the, in the way that the, the chuck holds the piece onto the jaws. Um, if there's a gap, and if you push on it, then the wood will try to fill that gap, and that could cause it to twist off. But if it's flat up against it, it can't go anywhere. Makes it much more secure. And with this particular cutter, uh, which is about a half inch across, which is just about the same height as the cutter, as the jaws, I can kind of use that as a guide to see how, how deep I want to make this. And if you find you make it a little bit too long, you can always take a little bit off the end. So I'm not going to take a whole, mo whole, much, whole bunch more off of there. Now because of this kind of a jaw set, uh, it has a slight dovetail. Actually, it's not really a dovetail. It, there's a little lip on the inside here. So what I like to do there is one of my few uh, skill skews, skew skills, is 
put a little, kind of a little groove right there that that, this little lip will grab a hold of. If you just have straight up and down, the, the jaw set that I use at home has a serrated edge, so I just make this really straight. So that should be fine. We'll make sure this is okay. Yep, that's about right. Uh, again, if you have any, anybody has any questions uh, at any time, feel free to, to uh, ask. And oh, I think that's going to be just about perfect, I hope. So I'll take out the... When I'm at home, you, the, 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 uh, the, the little four-prong uh, drive center that comes with the lathe is, is good, but uh, the, the stub kind of center, one's got the little jagged edge around the top, and it has a, like a spring-loaded pin. I like using that because those little pins really grab the wood really well, and uh, you don't have to pound the piece <coughs> as much to get it to, to fit on the jaws. <coughs> or get the, get the piece to fit onto the uh, onto that center without slipping. I'm just going to tighten this down a little and hope that this. Oh, I'm I am good, man. That is just perfect. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Okay, so I tighten this down. Now you'll notice that there's no gap between the jaw face and the wood. So I've got a good solid joint there. And as I say, if there were a gap, if there was a gap here and I pushed on this, you know, with the tool too hard, the wood could try to, to fill in that space and could end up flying off. This, this way, I know that I've got a good support all the way across. Now you may ask why I didn't use the tailstock to push this on yet. And the reason is I wanted to make sure that, that I have uh, this good support all the way around, which I do. Excuse me. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn the lathe slow, and I want to see how close this is. All right, good. Now after a short time, I won't be using the tailstock anymore. Uh, but for right now, I will. Anytime you can leave the tailstock engaged, you're better off, uh, just as that extra measure of support. But obviously, there's going to be a lot of times where <coughs> where you uh, can't use it. And once I get started on on the actual making of this, you'll see that the tailstock ends up coming off and not being used at all. I think I need one of those hats that's got the we can put beer cans in, a little straw. Keep me hydrated. <coughs> so I'm going to continue to use the uh, uh, Easy Wood tools on this. Now, one way I could do this, and I'm right now I'm up around 2,400. I don't turn really, really fast. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to see Jimmy Clues as one of the best teachers around, whatever the high speed of the lathe is, that's what he goes at, and uh, it works for him. Generally speaking, the faster you have the lathe going, the better, uh, because you get much smoother cuts. If I turn this way down, just as an extreme, and you can hear that chatter that I get. Now this is already pretty round, but still, and you can you, know, you can't really see it maybe, but the tool is kind of bouncing back and forth. Of course, I'm way way too slow, but if I get this turned up. To a much higher speed, up around 2,400. You can you can hear the difference, and you can definitely feel the difference when you're working. So the way I start these is uh, I I work from the tail stock in. And I'm just using this right now to, to kind of show you how to do it with a with a bowl gouge. You could even do this with a uh, um, a roughing gouge if you want. But when I'm working at home, generally speaking, I'm using one of one of the Easy Wood tools. And 
right now, all I want to do is get a little cylinder right on the end here, about a half inch in diameter. Okay, so that's pretty good. So then I want to take the tailstock away. From this point on, the tailstock is not going to be supporting anything. Uh, I want to get rid of this little uh, dimple that I've got from the tailstock. And then I want to cup this out very, very slightly. And the reason that I do that is that the bottom of the goblet itself is going to have a curve to it. So I want to have a little bit of a recess here so that the goblet will sit flat. Uh, I don't know if you can see right the, the joint. Oh, we're not using that, are we? We're just using the monitor? Okay. Um, so that there's no gap between this little, little support piece here and the goblet itself. And you could, again, use a variety of tools, but I'm going to use Again, the easy wood. This is the easy wood finisher, which has got a round cutter instead of a square one. And I just cut this out a little bit. Now, most of this wood's going to go away. So this is way bigger than I need, but I, I get a nice little concave cup in there. So the next thing that I want to do is um, I want to drill a small hole in the end. So if I can squeeze in here. Oh, you're good. And the Jacob's Chuck. This is a Jacob's Chuck, for those of you that don't know. Uh, I get there are quite a few, I, I hate to use the word beginner, but people that have not been turning for very long, is that correct? Yeah, how, how many of you have been turning for, say, less than a year? Okay, uh, less than two years? Okay, uh, so if there's a lot of things that I may say that you'll say, well, that's pretty obvious, but for the uh, the novices in the group, they may not. It may not be obvious. So usually, because it's such a small hole, I don't even tighten this down much. And when you're drilling, you don't want to drill at a really high speed. All I want to do is drill a. Uh, it's an eighth inch hole, about an eighth of an inch deep. And this is one of those cases where setting this up to do it takes a whole lot longer than actually uh, actually making the hole. The reason that I do that is that the goblet itself is going to have a little tenon on the bottom that will fit into that hole. It's a registration device so that the goblet sits upright and everything is, is held in the right place. It has the added advantage that <coughs> As this gets longer, uh, this is going to start to whip around a little bit, and that little hole, uh, I bring the, the tailstock up so it just touches that, and it, it keeps it from whipping around. But the t from this point on, the tailstock is not going to be providing any actual support. I'm, there will be no pressure on the wood going in. So now I get back, this, back up to speed. And I want to take very light cuts here. And you can hear a little bit of, hear that little vibration. That's because I'm uh, fairly far off of the headstock. And the only support that I've got is from this wood right here. And the key to, to doing this is that I keep this mass of wood here as long as I can. If I were to try to turn this the stem down all at the same time, keeping making everything thinner as I go, pretty soon there wouldn't be any support out here and the thing would just break off. <laughs> but by working in small increments, keeping this big mass of wood here, all the all the forces are being directed this way and the end of it's just hanging out here. It's not doesn't have any stress on it. So I'm gonna And I do this at a kind of a taper, mainly just to give myself a little bit of room for the tools. Uh, it doesn't affect the strength of it or anything. It's just it's just to uh, provide room to get the tools to move them in and out. All 
All right, so I'm getting this little cup part down about the diameter that I want. In essence, what I'm doing is I'm turning a very small goblet on the end of this stem. But that little goblet will then support the other one. And I'm going to do a little bit of sanding before I continue. Uh, sanding is a subject that can, you can spend, everybody's got their own opinion about sanding. Um, I use this is just the uh, Norton 3X paper that you can get. I keep bringing up woodcraft for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> you are keeping track of the number of times I say it because that's part of the contract, right? Okay. <coughs> but they, you know, that's what they're there for. Uh, and I, I start with uh, like a 150, then I go to a 220, then a 400. Um, I. On, on pieces like this, I will use like a friction polish, like the hut or something like that. But most of my pieces I use uh, lacquer, spray lacquer. And so I don't sand beyond normally about 220, maybe 400, because you end up, the lacquer fills all that in. You actually end up feeling the lacquer rather than the wood itself. If you're using an oil finish or something like that, then you'd probably want to sand to a much higher grit. But for, for what I do, this works fine. The other thing that I, I do is uh, the sanding pads that Norton makes, they're, the, they're like the spongy pads. Um, when I use those when I'm leveling out the lacquer, and I find after they're done, after I can't use them for that, you can see this one's all you know, banged up. I cut them into strips and I use them as, as this is a backer for the sandpaper. And it does a couple of things. It keeps the heat down from my hand, but it also kind of flattens out the paper a little bit and um, gives me a little bit more control. So even on bigger pieces, I'll use little strips like this. And I'm only doing this now because as this gets thinner down here, it won't be able to come back. So it's just easier to do it all now. Now, the reason that I left this at that larger diameter when I put that little cup into it is that if I didn't do that, um, i get some tear out along the end. If I waited to this point to put that little cup in, I would get chip out right at the end of this. So by doing it beforehand when it's still bigger and then taking it down, I avoid that. So that's something else to think about. All right, so now I'm going to start actually making the stem here. And I'm going to start out using a parting tool. This is just a Sorby 16th inch parting tool. Um, I'm not using it as a parting tool. I'm taking really, really light cuts. And I'm establishing about the length of that little cup that I want at the top. This part right here. Uh, I want to make sure that I don't go make it too short or I'll blow through that little hole that I drilled in. But usually if I have a, a quarter of an inch or thereabouts, or three-eighths of an inch long, then that's fine. Now you'll notice you can hear that little bit of vibration, right? I think you can hear it. If I, if I come in down here, you don't hear it, but because I'm way out here, you can. So to begin with, I'm going to take really, really light cuts, and you'll also notice that I'm going back and forth. So I'm treating this as just as a regular scraper. I'm not using it as a parting tool. I'm just it, that's what it is. It's basically a, a mini, mini scraper. I also have one that um, I ground the sides down on, so it's really, really thin at the at the cutting edge. I have to be a little careful because it's easier to go too deep. But I can do the same thing with it just to get started. But it's a little more dangerous because it's, it's easy to, to kind of get too aggressive with it and just break the thing off. So I'll come back to this. And all I'm doing right now <coughs> is kind of establishing the diameter that I want right near the top. 
And again, by moving back and forth, it reduces any stresses on the wood and it smooth, smooths things out. So the next thing that I want to do is round over this little cup on the end. Again, I'll bring up the skew. Can we back the uh, tripod up just a little? Thanks. Um, and again, my, you know, you didn't come here to learn how to use a skew. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> um, so this is about all I do with a skew, maybe a couple of other things. And there are plenty of other tools you could do this with. You can also use a skew on its side. So again, you're almost treating it like a scraper. And all I'm doing is rounding this over. If I left it flat straight across there, it, it would just look heavy and clunky. So that's it for the skew. Then I'll come in and... And I am not adverse to sanding to get the shapes that I want. Uh, I know some people want to have their final shape just from the tool uh, and to be able to turn a piece with that off the tool finish is a, is a, is a very admirable skill to have. Uh, it's not something I've really set out to do. <coughs> but I just want to get this rounded over here because once I get past this point, I can't come back. It's sort of a point of no return. Now I'm up to the 400 grit. And then I'm going to go back to the... And I want to have a nice crisp edge there. Now I'm only using about a third of the width of this cutter. It's only a sixteenth to begin with. But I don't want to be real aggressive because this is pretty delicate right here, especially in, until I get down a little bit more and I can start using uh, other tools. And again, by going back and forth, I can get the diameter down to where I want it, which is just about there. And then as I move back, I can start to get a little more aggressive. And then I will come in with some sandpaper in a little bit. But I want to try to get this as smooth as I can right now. So now I'm at a point where... I, I, don't, I don't know if you can hear it, but hear that kind of a vibration there, that little ticking sound? That's because this has gotten really thin here. So I really don't want to mess with that anymore. So I'm going to come back in with this. Basically from this point down, it's going to be a repeat of the same, op same operation. I'm going to come in. And I do have to take it a little bit slow to begin with. You can hear that vibration. Well, I have to take it pretty easy. Got loose. That'll do it. Down. Okay. It's really important to tighten your chuck down. <laughs> All right, that helps. So you, you, you can hear before the chuck was getting loose, and that's why I was getting all that vibration there. So again, I'm making this taper just so I have room to, to maneuver the tools in. And one of the things I like about these tools is I can cut sideways, you know, and go like that. 
which comes in really handy, especially on a really delicate part because then all the stresses are going this way instead of that way into the wood, or most of them anyway. So I get this down to about a quarter of an inch or so, and then I'll start using this, uh, the round cutter. I put my finger in back of it, kind of cradle it under my arm against my body, and just run it back and forth. The reason that I use the round one is that I'm only using the very tip of it, so it's, a, it's not an aggressive cut. And uh, I can take off wood fairly quickly, as you can see, but I'm not having to put a whole lot of pressure on it. So it's easier to control the cut and less likelihood of anything breaking. All right, so now I've got that pretty much the shape, the size that I want. And I'm going to start doing a little bit of sanding. I'll fold this in half. The sanding becomes a lot easier once this, this gets thinner. And by running the sandpaper back and forth and with this pad underneath it, I can really control the diameter that I want and the smoothness of it. And if I keep my thumb kind of on top of this, just supporting, not pushing on it, then um, I can put a fair amount of pressure on this and not have to worry too much about it breaking. So I'll go to a little bigger paper. Oh, that's looking pretty good there. One thing I've learned when I'm making these is that it tends to work better if there's a really, really slight taper to the, to the shaft rather than being straight up and down. Uh, visually, it works better because if you have a slight taper, see if that works there then your eye is led up to the, to the, to the top. And uh, I, I want to talk just, just for a second about why I do these to begin with. It's not just to show off, you know, wow, I can turn this really thin. But the whole point is that if you have a goblet like this and it's just sitting on a table, I mean, a small goblet, it's about that high or so, you know, it's a nice little piece, but you can't really, you don't really see it. I mean, it just kind of disappears into the tabletop. But if you elevate it, <coughs> then all of a sudden it has more of a presence, and your eye is automatically drawn to it. Whereas if it's, you know, particularly if your table's low, otherwise you're just looking down on something with everything else going on. This way, your your eye is compelled to, even if you see the base first, to follow it up and focus right on the piece itself. And that's kind of the underlying theme of all my work is the idea is to celebrate the turned part of the piece. Uh, in many of my pieces, the turned element is maybe relatively small overall, but it's the focus of the piece. And all the other stuff that goes on, the, the, the support legs and, and all this other stuff is designed to make your eye hit the, the turning and and make it the star. You know, you're really celebrating that turn element. Um, so that's that's the intent for doing this. That's the real reason. You know, I mean, it, it's one thing to kind of show you that you can do it just as a as a skill, but there should be a reason for that skill to exist. And that in that case, in this case, that's what that is. Is so that you know, it's like uh, oh, look at this, look at this. This is what I want. You want people to see. And uh, so that's the, that's the real reason. So all of my work is pretty much design driven. Uh, it may be part of that design may be because I've got a really terrific piece of wood to work with, but my overall concept on almost anything I do is based on design and what will make that piece of wood, you know, really stand out. So that's kind of the reason for it. Plus, it's, people go, wow.
That's cool. <laughs> and the other thing that I've learned when I do workshops with this particular one, which we'll do tomorrow, uh, is that it, it, I find it to be a really good confidence builder for people because, uh, and, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but I've had people beforehand say, I don't think I can make that. And then when they see how it's done, and it's really all physics. <coughs> so all the, the geek group people here should just, you know, relate to that really well. But it's just the physics of the way the wood is mounted in the lathe. And then they get it done and says, wow, I didn't think I could do that. And it's like, you know, you develop that skill. And whether or not you want to make these um, is almost beside the point. It's the idea that once you know how to do it, then you can apply that to a whole myriad of other types of projects. So if you like to do finials, you know, what you learn here is very helpful with that. Or you may find other means of expression where you want something really long and skinny like that. So it's just a way to build up that skill. So I continue on down. And as I get closer to the headstock, you can see I can get a little more aggressive. This one isn't real long anyway, so uh, once I got the chuck tightened down properly, then it makes it a lot easier. I don't like to go really thin all at once because there's a chance that the tool could slip and just cut right through the whole thing. So that's why I start out with this little bit bigger cylinder and then work my way down. Uh, one of the keys on using the easy wood tools, is, particularly the flat one, is not to use the whole face of it. I mean, you can, but it takes a lot more aggressive cutting and it's a lot more pressure on the wood. So if you, if you can see what I'm doing, I'm only using maybe a half to a third of it, but it goes really quick, so I'm not, you know, you can see how fast it goes, so I'm not really concerned about it. So I get it down to that point, I almost went too far. And again, I come in with the round one. And bring this down to the diameter that I want, or close to it. bigger than I really want, but I can sand it down pretty fast. And I can actually sand all the way out to the end here, as long as I keep my finger on top. I don't, I wouldn't want to use any, any lower grit than this, because I don't want the paper to catch on the wood at any point. <coughs> so if I went like, say, 40 grit, I could just grab it. I was, at a, I was at a demo someplace, and the guy was talking about sandpaper and grits and all that, and, you know, coarse grit, you know, like 60 grit. Somebody brought him a piece of paper with two rocks on it. <laughs> but here's your two grit paper. Probably could work, I don't know. And by keeping the sandpaper in motion all the time, uh, that helps smooth it out and avoids putting too much pressure on it. I'm, I'm using very little pressure here. And there is a tendency to put too much pressure on sandpaper anyway. Everybody does it, uh, regardless of what kind of work you're doing. If you're doing flat work, you're, you know, you're really getting down with the sander. And it, it's uh, self-defeating because the, the, all that does is cause the paper to dig in and leave more tool marks. So um, you really only need to use a, a fairly light touch with it. Now pretty soon I'm going to have to put the uh, tailstock back up just to keep this end from whipping around. Oops. 
All right, I don't know if you can, you can see how it's starting to vibrate on the end there. I'm gonna do that. About one more time and it's gonna really start to, sh to shake around, so I'll bring the tailstock back up then. All right, now you can see that. See how that's moving? When I, when I see, how, see how the end is whipping around there? So I'm at the point where I need to support that a little bit. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out was is that on anything you're working on, there's a lot of visual clutter in back. You know, depending on where your lathe is, if it's up against the wall or, or you've got stuff on the floor or whatever, your eye is going to be distracted by all this stuff here. Even the banjo and whatever's on the floor can get in the way. And so it's a good idea sometimes if you're having a problem really focusing on the piece, just take a piece of cardstock and tape it on back here somewhere, prop it up so that you have a good white neutral background against the wood. It'll really show up any little defects and it'll just help you focus on on the piece itself a lot better without being distracted by all the, the stuff that's lying around. Uh, 150? Well, I end up going about 400. Mainly because on this I use a friction polish, so it's not quite the same as the lacquer finish that I use. No, because I end up, um, I'll, even when I get down to the end, I'll do a, like a final sanding pass all the way through it just to get it to make sure. Also, if I put the friction polish in, on in stages, there might be a chance I could end up with overlapping and it wouldn't be real smooth all the way through. It is a little tricky and I'll, I'll, I don't have any with me, but when, you, when we get to the end, I'll talk about how I put that on. Uh, you have to be really delicate with it when you when you apply it. So, uh, but when I get to that point, I'll talk about that a little bit. I'm going to move this stuff back over here. <coughs> so now I, I want to I'm going to bring the tailstock up, but. All it's going to do, I'm going to bring it up until it just is ready to start turning, just about there. So the only thing that that's doing is keeping this from whipping. It's not providing any kind of structural support at all. It's just there to keep keep that from flipping around when I'm turning on. Uh, if you know, help prevent any possibility of, of it breaking. Again, I'm taking these really light cuts here. So as you can see, it really shows up now that all of the stress is from this point back. All this out here is just floating there, so there's no, you know, that's the reason that this works this way, and I can make these really long because I'm not doing anything at this end. It's all at this end. It does take some concentration. It's not something you can do while you're watching TV or anything. And it's probably best not to have too many cocktails beforehand. <laughs> so
So again, I'm keeping my thumb on top. The, the, the diameter of this is small enough that there's really no heat buildup. So that's not really an issue. And as you can see, I'll, I can you know continue to sand all the way out to the end here if I need to, which helps just smooth everything out a little bit. Now there are other ways to do this. Uh, there's demonstrators that will do the entire goblet as one piece, and they'll do some really long pieces. I think generally they make their stems a little thicker. Uh, because if you've got this big mass of a goblet out here, if you have something really thin, it's going to be, it's going to have too much torque on it, and it's liable to twist it off. Um, and there are also different kinds of rests, uh, like they, there's a string rest, which is like two pieces of string that are crisscross in the middle on a form that you can use to help support this. Um, if you wanted to do something like this long, you could use a, like a steady rest in the middle. Um, like a um, spindle steady to help support it, but generally speaking, I just do mine this way, and I've done them as long as about 16 inches, and uh, for that I just use a piece that's maybe three by three by whatever length I need. Um, a lot of wood goes away, but I don't have to use any supports then. So now I can get pretty aggressive. But I'm getting really close to the headstock. And pretty soon I'll start worrying about the base here. important that you keep support in back of the piece while you're working on it. Uh, no real pressure, just enough to keep it from bending. Okay. And I'm sorry? In a way, yeah. Yeah, they are, because I've, uh, I've got my, my finger in back here. And so I'm kind of equalizing the pressure on both sides. So I'm not pushing really hard, just enough. It's kind of a touch thing. You sort of develop the touch for how, you know, you, you can tell pretty quickly how hard you can push on something before it'll cause problems. But the idea is that I want the pressure going in and the pressure this way to be about the same. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of doing it a, a few times to develop a feel for it. I'm just doing some more, more sanding. Oops. Never get your hand next to the chuck. That can hurt a little bit. And it's also a good idea, uh, this, this kind of an aside here, on, on your chuck, if, if you can avoid having the uh, this part here stick way out. <laughs> that really hurts. <laughs> if it's going fast enough, you almost don't feel it, you know? Okay, so um, now I want to start thinking about the base, and the base is going to end up probably about in here somewhere. And if you'll notice, oops, sorry. The uh, the base that I, I generally use is is shaped like this. It's kind of a bell, trump, trombone bell shape. Uh, see, it all comes back, comes around, doesn't it? Um, and I, I like this shape because it, it just pulls your eye up. And I usually uh, put a little chamfer on the underneath side. 
so that it will, it, it does two things. It visually lifts it, you know, off the table, um, creates a little shadow line there, but also if, if the tabletop, for whatever reason, is not real flat and smooth, it disguises that, that fact, so you don't have any little gaps showing. You just have the, a kind of a big gap underneath there, so I think that works. Anyway, back to this. Okay, so now I'm at the point where I'm going to start working on the, on the base. So I'm going to take a little more care in how I turn this down. I'm sort of establishing the curve a little bit for the base. Just enough that I have a rough idea what it's going to look like. And again, I'll come in and narrow this down. And this is where I really want to get the taper going. So I'm actually going to spend a little time starting to shape this. And I want to pull this around so I get a nice smooth form. Now this base is going to be too big. So I'm just going to bring it down. The other thing I wanted to mention is once you establish a diameter uh, in a blank, uh, if I were to you know, cut into it like that. All the the, struct, the the structural strength of the wood is going to be this this inner diameter or less. Uh, no matter how big the diameter is out here, where you've taken all that wood away, that's that's the extent of the of the structure that you have. So that's one of the reasons you don't want to take much wood away from the headstock in until you're actually down there ready to do it. Uh, because now, I mean, it's no big deal, but all of my strength is on in that inner diameter rather than the outer diameter. So I want to continue on here and just pull this around. And I want to take really, really light cuts. One of the other things I like about these tools is that you can cut both on the inside, or in, in stroke, as well as the outside. You cut, cut both going in and coming out, uh, so you don't have to re-engage the wood each time, and it makes it, a, makes it a little easier to get a nice smooth cut. Well, that doesn't look too bad. I think it's creeping up on me all the time. It's getting ready to attack me here. I'm going to turn the speed down. This is another thing that there are split opinions about is sanding speed. Uh, I find particularly on something this small, it's really not a big deal. But on bigger pieces, uh, for me anyway, I find that I get a smoother sanding if I run it at a slower speed. Some people have it cranked up all the way throughout the entire process, but I find I get fewer uh, scratches and sanding marks if I do it at a slower speed. And again, you kind of want to end up on a on a uh, on a downward slope. You always want to make your final cuts on a spindle turning in, so that you have supporting fibers in back of the cut. Uh, if you if you cut out this way, you're cutting away from the, the supporting fibers, and they'll tend to you'll tend to get a little more tear out. But if you're always cutting into the fibers, then you get a much smoother smoother cut that way. Let's 
stop that. It's not too bad. A little finer grit. This 400 grit paper and the 220 paper, almost the same color. It's a little hard to figure out which is which. Normally I would use like wet dry, the, the really dark stuff for the 400, but I just picked this stuff up. It works really nicely and it's cheaper than the wet dry, but it is a little hard to identify by color. What was that? Woodcraft did I hear? <laughs> I'll be sure to talk to him later about that. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. And you don't have one of those, the R store here, do you? The the other. <laughs> oh, okay. Won't say that word. <laughs> if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'll, I'll tell you later. Yeah. Uh, you know where the highest volume wood woodcraft is? No, Honolulu. Also, Honolulu has the highest volume Costco and highest volume Home Depot in the country. Go figure. They, Really? Of course, you know, it's a little hard to get stuff to Hawaii, so. And they have some of the, they have some of the coolest wood out there, man, I'll tell you. And each island is different, too. All right, well, anyway, um, topic for another time. So now I've got the basic shape done, and it's pretty smooth. And so now what I want to do is I want to work on this little chamfer underneath. Uh, as you can see, normally the pieces that I do tend to be a little bit longer than that. But for a demo like this, you know, after you see this little process four or five times, it's like, all right, you know, uh, I've had enough. <laughs> and it becomes a test to see if if I will actually succeed with it. There we go. <coughs> I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, yeah, I actually do. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, often I will, well, most of the time, I'll make the goblet part first, and then I'll use the diameter of that to determine the diameter of the base. And uh, I like to have the base to be at least the same diameter as as the goblet, uh, or a little bit bigger. If you'll notice on this one, uh, this diameter is slightly less than this diameter. Uh, and when I, I, when I do the slideshow of these, you'll see some of my earlier efforts that was reversed and it really shows up, you know, it, it makes it look very top heavy. And if you look at the long one over there, you, you can see that as well, that the base on that one, I'll just go over there. That the, this diameter is a little bit less than that diameter. And so uh, proportionally, these are, you know, except for the, th the size of the stem itself, but the proportions of this to this are about the same as the proportions of this to this. And on this one, the, the base is smaller, although I don't think a really a base this big would, would work as well anyway. Um, just because this is so big. But I do find that it's best to have the, the base this slightly larger than the diameter of the vessel itself. Now if you do something like a you know a freeform type of top, uh, which I've done a few of, uh, where it's maybe a natural edge piece or something. Uh, sometimes th that's going to be bigger just because of the nature of it, so you can't use that as a hard and fast rule, but it's a good rule of thumb to go by. So 
Let me get this finished up here since it looks like lunch is here. So what I'm going to do is I want to bring in the this base a little bit. <coughs> Just give me room to work. One thing I want to point out when you're actually using this as a parting tool, you don't want to part everything off in one shot. Uh, the the wood can swell a little bit, it can grab the tool and actually pull it out of your hand. So you want to make sure that you go in a little ways, come out and go in next to it and go back and forth like that. It's a much safer cut that way. So now what I want to do is, is put a little chamfer on the underneath side of this and you'll notice that I've left this longer than I actually want. Uh, this gives me a little bit of a fudge factor there where I can come back in and, and creep up on the actual size that I want later. If I tried to do it, the, the finished size all at the same time, I may not be happy with it and of course I can't any, add anything back. And I want to do this fairly light cut, so I'm going to end up with a pretty sharp edge here. So I want to make sure that I don't get any tear out. So you'll notice that I'm actually tipping the tool on its side. This is not in the manual that, you know, that Easywood talks about, uh, but I've talked to other turners that use these tools a lot and they agree that this is a good way to uh, get a much smoother cut, you get much less tear out because you're basically treating it like a negative rake scraper because it's tilted this way. That's pretty good. So, that one little line that I want to get rid of. And in essence, the Easywood tools are high tech scrapers. They all function the same way, which is one of the reasons there's really no learning curve to them. But when you look at the operation of the tool, you, it's, it's the same idea as taking a scraper where you're just pushing it against the wood, the wood is pulled off that way. It's the same, same principle. It's just extremely sharp carbide. So that looks good. Do a little sanding. I don't like to do a whole lot of sanding on this because I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to round this over or anything. I want to keep it kind of a straight line. And I want to make sure that I don't have any tear out right at this at this joint. I want to make sure I've got a good clean line there. And this one's good. <coughs> um, which is one of the nice things about working with hard maple. Uh, it, it lends itself to good crisp detail like that. And keeping crispness in detail is a very good thing. If, if you start to get rounded over edges and stuff, the piece the light doesn't reflect the same way and the piece tends to lose a little bit of that snap uh, that you get if you have a, a nice clean sharp edge. So now I want to really think about parting this off and I want to make the base about like that. Now you'll notice that I'm putting the tool in at an angle. Uh, anytime you make a base for a piece, you want it to be concave a little bit, so the piece will always sit flat. If you cut it off flat, the wood can swell and you end up with a round bottom and it won't sit flat. So this way, making it concave, takes care of that problem. I do a final little sanding right on the bottom just to eliminate any little bit of tear out that I might have right there. And once this is parted off, then I will uh, power sand the rest of it. it it's, you could reverse chuck these because this, this thing is small enough it'll fit in the hole all the way. Uh, I, I really don't do that, I just usually sand it down. Uh, but. If you were really ambitious, you could reverse chuck it, make a little jam chuck, even use the same piece of wood to make kind of a jam chuck to finish off the bottom, because this will still turn freely. But uh, I don't do that, so 
At this point, I would do the finishing. Now, we, somebody asked about the finishing earlier, and what I would do now is, if I'm using a friction polish, I would probably start it around uh, maybe 1,000, 1,200 RPM, and uh, put the friction on, friction polish on with like a paper towel. You, you generally don't want to use cloth on any kind of finishing on the lathe, because if, if the wood could grab it, and if you get your fingers wrapped up in the cloth, you can pull your fingers with it. Paper towel is just going to tear it. <coughs> now the friction polish I use, which is the hut, um, it, it's okay. Uh, I'm going to start to investigate other brands. It does get a little tacky, and sometimes the paper towel actually get caught on here, and I have to stop the lathe and unwind it real carefully. Uh, but what I'll usually do is put a couple drops on the towel, run it across back and forth, and then with another towel, smooth it out and get the friction part of it going, then I'll turn the speed up. And I may end up at about 20, almost full speed again for the final layer. As long as I've got this support here to keep this from bending at all, I can be reasonably aggressive when I'm putting the finish on. And uh, I, you know, you can get two or three coats of that and get a pretty nice finish. Uh, this, this last uh, symposium I went to, one of the turners there, he actually would, his first coat was the, was the thin super glue, and he would put that on the whole piece, just a, you know, with a, with a, I think he was using a cloth, but you use a paper towel. Of course, you don't want to get it on you. <coughs> Excuse me. But he would put it on as the lathe was turning. It dries almost instantly. And then he put on a, uh, uh, a coat of uh, triple, triple D, I think it's called. It's a bucking compound. And then he would follow that with a coat of wax. And it gave a, the piece a really nice, deep, rich shine very, very quickly. I mean, like three coats and he was done. So that's something that you might want to look into. It's definitely something I want to experiment with. Just know if you haven't worked with super glue, uh, it, it, it's nasty. <laughs> It's not a good adhesive for wood. Uh, you can use it to fill cracks. You, a lot of pin turners use it as a finish, but you don't want to use it to glue wood parts together, really, because it's it's not as good a support as like tight bond or something like that would be. But as a finish, and this fellow, you know, he's pretty well known, at least in the southern hemisphere, um, has had really good success with it. And it's a really, really nice finish. So, but the friction polish works well too. All right, so now I've put all that polish on and got that all done. And I'm just going to part this off. Now, I, you do get tear out when you're using a parting tool, it's really unavoidable. Uh, I've got another easy wood tool that I used in the other demo that can alleviate that, but you got to have a lot more wood available. So now I'm at a point where I just kind of hang on to the to it, and I end up with a you know kind of a rough end, but I'll, I'll sand that out, and uh, basically that's it. Now, like I said, if you wanted to rechuck this, reverse chuck it, you could you could do that. Um, I usually get in a hurry and don't, but it may be a good idea because then you can put little detail rings and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, it's a little short, but that's that's basically how those are done. So if you look at that and then you look at those over there, uh, you'll see that it's all the same process. Just on the big ones, I started out with a little bit thicker piece of wood, so it's maybe two and a quarter square, and but I did this exact same thing, it's just longer. And the reason I can do it is because once this part here is done, there's no stress on it. All the stresses are at this end, so I can make it as long as I want, as long as I have a big enough piece of wood. So give it a try, you know. No, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that. That's something I do want to mention. Um, I'm very left-handed, and uh, Actually, the only thing I, I learned to do right-handed was play the trombone. But uh, regardless of which hand you favor, 
it's a really good idea to learn to use the other hand as well. And this will show up when I do the, uh, the suspended vessel this afternoon. I do a lot of it right-handed. There are certain things on the lathe I think are easier to do left-handed, like when I was just parting that off, because otherwise you gotta kinda go like this. And by being able to hold the, the tool in my left hand and use my right hand for support, uh, it's much less awkward standing there. So I, I, I do think it's a very good idea to train yourself to use both hands not necessarily equally, but at least enough to where you're comfortable using your your l the less dominant hand um, to be able to do certain operations. It'll just make the turning a little safer and a little more enjoyable in the long run. So thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so what I want to do, and I don't know, this isn't this isn't actually square. Uh, this is Paduke, I guess. It kind of looks like Paduke. Yeah. Is that what it is? There's a piece of Coco Bolo in there, but I don't, I don't want to do that for a demo. It's too nice. And besides, there are some people that are that have issues with Coco Bolo. And since I don't have a full face mask, I don't really want to use it. So we'll get started here. So I'm going to go back between centers. Now normally at home um, I would use, um, I wouldn't mess with that. I wonder if I could get away with it. No, this isn't really square, so I better not. And I'm just going to kind of guess. This is going to end up pretty small anyway, so we'll see how this goes. This is a nice lathe, by the way. I, I had one of these for a while, and I, I sort of had tool envy, wanted something bigger, so I ended up getting a Powermatic, which I really like, but it's about twice as much money. But if you're looking for a good lathe that's, you know, it's not super heavy, but it does have a lot of really nice features. The, the headstock slides all the way, so you can do outboard turning down at the end. Um, or you can just do, you know, you can slide it down and set the tool rest here and work on the end and do things that are a little awkward otherwise. And it's got a pretty fair amount of power and uh, it's a really nice lathe. And it's kind of the, the almost the default lathe for a lot of clubs. Uh, very reliable, uh, both Jet, Powermatic, Performax uh, is a really good company. Uh, when I've had issues, they have taken care of it right away. I'm not really, I'm not make, doing this as a plug for woodcraft or anything, but if you are looking for a kind of a mid-size lathe that isn't, you know, getting up into the one-way level, uh, this is a good choice to have. And it, when I do demos around, I like working on this, I like working on the Powermatic, there are others I don't like as well, but this is a nice one. So, another plug for... So what I'm going to do, I didn't get this mounted really straight, but that's okay. Again, I'm just going to turn this into a cylinder, and I'm actually just going to use the this. Sure, I get this on good and tight. So as you can see, this pretty much lives up to the its name, which is the Easy Wood Rougher, and it does a pretty nice job of of uh, roughing things out. Again, I don't want to get make this uh, ten and too small. That's just about where I want it. And uh, maybe, whoops, wrong one. Maybe make this a little longer. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ray Key. 
He's a, a production turner from England. He's been turning for, I don't know, 40 years or so. Um, he, he did a demo at our club uh, last spring. The guy's like in his 70s and he's still going like he's 20. And, um, but he, he's turning, he does a lot, you know, a lot of bowls and, and little vessels and stuff, but he makes his tenons like about an eighth of an inch or so. And nothing ever falls off. So, but when you're doing it for 40 years, I guess you figure all that out. And I've, you know, seen a lot of other turners that, that have really small tenons. I tend to err on the side of caution, I guess. So again, you can see that I've got a good tight uh, meeting where the, where the faces meet there. It's really tight, there's no gaps. And what I'm gonna do is put the tailstock back up. Uh, one other thing I wanna mention is occasionally it's a good idea to put a, a, a spur center in and, you're, and a good a live center with a good sharp point, bring the points together just to make sure you're laid. Everything is lined up just right. Uh, sometimes a uh, lathe can get off a little bit. And usually in a, in a lathe like this, it's because the floor isn't even or, or whatever. So it, it, the, the bed can rack a little bit. And so usually all you have to do is take one corner and adjust it one way or the other until the points line back up. But uh, it's a good idea to do that. And if you buy a new lathe, that's probably one of the first things you wanna do is make sure those points line up. Some lays that, that have a movable headstock uh, are kind of fussy in, in getting those points to line back up. And you know, if you've got one where it's permanently mounted, like uh, like a one-way or something like that, then you have much less of an issue. But uh, and I think the like the, most of the small lays, like the minis, are pretty pretty well set anyway. It's just a good idea every once in a while to check it out, make sure everything is lined up just right. I did a demo of this thin stem thing at a club and the lathe was so far off it kept breaking the stems. I said, I know that's, my, that's not my fault. <laughs> I knew it wasn't anything I was doing. Because I never, I never make mistakes like that, right? That never happens. So I'm not real crazy about working with this without a shield. But it actually feels a little wet. Kind of interesting. Some, some people will have a re, uh, an allergic reaction to certain woods. Fortunately, I don't seem to, but you never know. So I'm, I'm trying to get the diameter down on this to kind of go with that base that I made. Um, and that's why it, it's usually better to do the goblet first. Okay, that's pretty close. Let's see, let's come in with this. And what I'm really, really what I'm right doing right now is just shaping the upper part of the goblet. So the goblet's going to end up maybe that big. Uh, this block is really a little bit bigger than I really need, but that's okay. Um, so I'm just really kind of getting that basic curve. And I don't want to cut into this too much 
I want to cut into it just enough that I can sort of sense the shape of the, that the goblet's going to be. So that's pretty good as far as the diameter goes. So I'll just do this really quick. I don't want to do a lot of sanding because it, it is Paduke. Um, Easywood makes a, uh, a shield that fits over these. Uh, the, the chips or the shavings tend to fly directly back from the cutter edge. Uh, unlike a, a gouge where they'll go off to the side, these come kind of straight back. So they make a little deflector shield that fits on here and it does a really good job of, of getting all that those shavings out of the way. So again, minimal sanding here. Okay, so the next thing that I would do is uh, drill a hole, a starter hole. Get that down a little bit and Now this uh, particular drill bit, I actually brought for this, this afternoon, so it's a little overkill for this. And actually, I, I really prefer to use a, a Forstner bit for this, um, but I didn't bring one because the, the, because the point on this is so long, it's gonna you know, just make more to have to cut out. So I'm only gonna probably come down to about there on it. With a Forstner bit, it's slower cutting, but you get a flatter bottom with a, just a little bit of a, a, a point where the, uh, the point of the bit is. <coughs> so it's a little less time consuming to take that out than it is with something like this. <coughs> this I actually got, do you have Harbor Freight here in Grand Rapids? Okay, that's where this came from. The Woodcraft, you gotta spread the wealth, you know. And this really isn't the right bit for this, but it... Oh, I lost... Wow, smoking. And way off center. Harbor Freight. Harbor Freight. <laughs> yep, what you pay for. <laughs> well, I've used this thing like three times. You think it'd be okay. All right, so that's, a, that's enough to get a starter thing going. Um, actually, it, it does work pretty well on the, on the, uh, ho the hollow forms. Uh, Forstner bits tend to be really slow. So, so anyway, I've got the, the outside shape here pretty much the way I want it. And I've got just enough of a curve that I can kind of see how that shape's going to curve over. So this is an area where I find that the Easywood tools really excel. Uh, could I ask you to back up a little bit more? Thank you. Um, again, now when you're when you're turning on the inside of something, you want to be at or above center. You don't want to be below center because if the wood comes around and you can grab the tool and pull the tool right into the wood, regardless of the kind of tool you're using. So if you're at, if you're above center and it tends to grab it, it'll just grab air. And it's a much safer way to do it, and you'll be able to tell pretty quickly if 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 the tool is actually in the right position. So when I first start the hollowing process. Now this is a case where I'm doing something right-handed when normally I'm left-handed. Um, I take very, very light cuts. You hear that vibration? That's because the drill bit uh, Oh, I didn't get drilling nearly far enough. That's because the drill bit, when it was going in, was not perfectly centered. I mean, you can kind of see it wobbling around there. Um, 
So I'm not gonna really go through the whole process here. I'm just gonna kind of get started with it because uh, it does take a little bit of time. And I didn't, as I said, I didn't get the hole really drilled deep enough. But essentially I wanna end up with a wall that, see how much more I can get dig out of the middle here. Uh, wall thickness of maybe a 16th or so. You don't want a, a very thick wall. You want to have a, a light vessel to sit on these things, otherwise this is going to start to droop. And um, so you want to keep the vessel itself pretty light. Now you'll notice I can kind of go up and down with this, which helps get rid of that nub in the middle. It also sort of makes its own hole that way. Uh, if I'm home doing this, I've got, you know, air close by that I can blow this out. Um, can't do that here, but... And then I basically work on the upper part. Now, I hear, hear that noise because the wall is getting thin. If I tried to thin out the entire vessel all at one time, this wall is going to get so thin it's going to start to vibrate. You wouldn't be able to sand it really smoothly. If it's a closed form where there's a lid on it, like, like the things over there, that's not that important. But on something like this, where you actually can get your finger down in there and see inside, you want that inside wall to be just as smooth as the outside. So if you try to take all this wood out all at once, it's going to become so thin that it'll start to move, and there's no way you can ever get it smoothed out completely. So I usually... Will do maybe uh, an inch or so deep. I'm going to stop it for a second. Now I, I have a set of calipers here that I don't really need them for this. I could use a regular Sorby kind of caliper, but. Uh, if we have time this afternoon to get into the split bowl, that's the reason I made this. But, you know, you can make a set of calipers pretty easily. The only thing that you have to be sure of is that the distance from this point to the center is exactly the same as this point to the center, so that when you open these up, uh, the gaps will be identical. And this is just made out of some scrap uh, maple strip boards that I had lying around. And, you know, obviously being out of wood, it's not going to last forever, but it's lasted for several months now on, on several trips that I've taken. Um, so it's pretty durable. And, you know, for something like this, I can set it in there and I can see just how thick my wall is. And it's pretty thin. I'm just about at the point where I should stop right there. Wow, it's really thin. So that's good. I lucked out. But uh, I, I left a, a, a CD with uh, Ron that has a little diagram of how to make this. You can make it whatever size you want, whatever shape. The, this shape isn't really important. I just made it big enough that it would fit around just about anything I want to make. But you can make it as big or as small as you want, just keeping in mind that the, the points are equidistant from the center. That's the only thing you have to worry about. So it's coming in really handy, especially on long things, because like the Sorby, the, the figure eight ones, can't get really deep inside a lot of things. So again, I'm not going to do any more hollowing here. It's really too shallow. Uh, at, at home, I would go another half an inch or so deeper. But I do want to show you just how I do the outside here and turn this off. And what I want to do is bring the tailstock back up. Good question. Uh, I don't use a stick. I use a, uh, a set of hemostats, uh, clamping scissors. You can get those at Home Depot, probably Woodcraft. Do you have those? They don't? Well, uh, I mean, you can get them online. There's all kinds of places you can get them. Uh, I think 
uh, Harbor Freight has them too. And uh, I was going to bring some and I, they escaped somehow. But what I do is I'll take this little strip that I've got and I'll cut off a piece like about that, fold it over, fold sandpaper over that, clamp it to the hemostat and just stick it inside there. And that does a really good job because you don't get your fingers inside. Um, the important thing is not to stick your fingers in the holes in the, in the, in the scissors, but uh, then you can just change grits of paper and I, it, it, I can get all the way down to the bottom and around the sides on the inside. And this does a really nice job. And then I also apply finish that way. I'll take that friction polish and put paper towels on the hemostat and dribble the finish on, stick that inside and rub it around. Keeps your hands free from it and it does make a nice smooth, uh, does a nice good, a good job that way. A lot better than sticking your fingers in there. You can take a stick, but then you got to either put, you know, some kind of a pad that'll hold sandpaper or something. And I just find that these scissors are really quick. They're cheap. Uh, okay. Almost got too tight there. All right. So the in this case, the the live center is going to support this as I get this turned down to where I'm ready to part it off. So I won't take this off anymore. <coughs> so I'm going to take a little bit more off here. And I'm going to switch to this other, this is the uh, Easywood uh, detailer. That show up and as you can see it's got a diamond shaped tip on it uh, it, would, it was designed to do like coats like this kind of thing but I find it really effective when I'm working in kind of tight quarters and for finishing off uh, the bottoms of things like this and this afternoon when I do the other one you'll see how it really works with that uh, you have to be a little careful with this in that you don't want to get these wings caught in the wood because it can grab it. But you can see I can get Now you can do the same thing with uh, if you're you know a good uh, spindle gouge. And again, by turning on his side, I can get um, I can control any of the tear out that I get. So again, this is this that's what happens when you lose concentration. And there's still a whole lot of wood in there, more than I would like to have, but uh, just for demo purposes, it'll work. And then I'll just stand this around. Again, just a rough sanding. And then come in, oops, come in some more with this. And actually what I found is I can get like on these uh, close, these uh, suspended vessels, I can actually get down almost inside the chuck body with it. If I go in for, if I want to get a nice long tapered point, uh, I can really get inside there. So uh, I find it to be a very handy, much more handy than I thought it would be when I first got it. So again, by, use, by keeping the tailstock in, engaged and it is important that tailstock is actually engaged because if it's not, this will start to wobble and it can break off. So I did want to make sure that this is really spinning at the same speed that the, the uh, goblet is. 
So you can see that I'm using this as a major part of the support. Now I could um, just cut this off, reverse chuck it, and do it that way, but that's more work. So I, for me anyway, I find that this is a lot faster and I can get the same results. So the next thing I want to do is I want to set my vernier caliper and if you don't have a, one of these, you can get a... This is a really handy tool. I use, I rely on this a lot. Uh, this one's about shot, it's been used so much. But you can get the dial ones and all that, but one like this, a basic one like this, comes in really, really handy. And, I, you know, I often use it like I did with the chuck. I don't even pay attention to what the measurement is. It's just a transferable um, uh, guide. In this case, I want, I want a little tenon on the end of this to be a little less than an eighth of an inch diameter, because that's the size of the hole that I put into this. So I want that to fit inside that hole. So I'll use this to, to gauge that, and then I'll just come in for this last part and use the uh, parting tool. And at this point, I still have enough support from the tailstock that I can do any final little sanding that I need to do right at the end there. So I'm not quite there yet. And again, I'm moving the tool back and forth. Okay, got that. So now I'll just keep it supported and I'm just keeping a very small little tenon on the end there. And I need to, does anybody have a knife? Yep. Yeah, don't throw it at me. <laughs> oh. Uh. I don't want to mess up anything here. I'm not a, a real big fan of knives. They kind of scare me for some reason. I shouldn't say that as a woodturner. Isn't that part of the rules? You're supposed to carry a knife with you at all times? Oh, sorry. Well, it wasn't anything to see, but... So all I did was cut off that little fuzzy thing that was on the end. So I end up with a, a little tenon. You have it there? Okay. That's a little tiny tenon. Now this is really heavy because I didn't hollow it out completely. But, make sure this fits. Yep. So the, the tenon fits in that little hole. So when I glue it in, it, everything is registered and it'll it'll hang straight so if you look at this the the proportions are pretty good the the diameter of the vessel is a little bit smaller than the diameter of the stem um, so that makes it work better than if it was if it was a lot bigger so you know um, and I, I'll just pass these around just don't pay too much attention because this is still pretty rough on the inside and it's, way, way too thick, but you get the idea of how all that works. So, uh, anybody have any questions about part A? <laughs> Thank you. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.